This morning we continue our study in the book of Jonah and we're not moving very quickly because today we're going to cover a verse and a half. We turn our attention to Jonah 1 verses 3b through 4 today. Hear the word of our Lord for us. Jonah went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand. And understanding that we may believe, and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Newton's first law says that objects in motion tend to stay in motion until another force acts on them. And so if you roll a ball across the floor, it will keep rolling until the force of friction eventually slows it down. His second law says that force equals mass times acceleration. I don't know how to incorporate that in anything, but it's interesting math, I guess. And his third law, though, ties directly to our text from today, where he says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This is important to know when you have a teenager learning how to drive in your car, these laws of motion, because when your car is moving, it will keep going until a force acts on it, and if that force hits it hard, your car will bounce back, and that is not good news. And so these are important things you want, you want to know when you get behind a car and you start driving. But it's also important in our lives that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction because when we sin, there is always a storm that will follow in our lives. There's always a reaction to that sin in our lives. Jonah refuses to go to Nineveh and God sends a great wind on the sea and the word translated as sent is a little more graphic in, in the Hebrew. It's the word hetel, which none of you need to know beyond this today. But what it means is to throw something forcefully. And usually it's used to describe a warrior throwing their spear at the enemy. So imagine you don't gently throw your spear. It's like, I don't know how to throw a spear. So you do it really hard, I guess. And there's probably some anger and there's, like, there's some passion and intentionality in throwing that spear. It's, it's what David does when he throws the stones at Goliath, right? He does it with force. He does it with intention. He wants it to accomplish something. God is not going, I think I'll send a breeze. Oh, it's a little bigger than I thought. He's sending a great storm on purpose. He's hurling it at Jonah. This is the way that the world works. Sin leads to storms in our life. We can try to hide the sin. We can try really hard to keep the storms at bay that sin might cause. But sin leads to storms. It leads to chaos in our lives. Near the end of the book of Numbers, the people of Israel are getting close and coming nearer to conquering the land of Canaan. And two of the tribes, or one and a half of the tribes, decide that they don't want to cross the Jordan. They want to stay in the land they've already conquered on the east side of the promised land. But then Moses says, you may do that only if you commit that you will come in and help the other tribes conquer the land that God has given to them. And then he says this, it says, if you fail to do this in Numbers 32, you will be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Because sin always finds us out. It always leads to a consequence. It's always eventually discovered. If you run your hand along the grain of wood, it's very smooth. But if you, run or, if you run your hand against the grain, it feels rougher. And if you do it often enough, you will get a sliver in your hand. It's what happens with wood when you run against the grain. When we sin, we're running against the grain of life. We're running against how God designed and created us and the world to work. And when you do that, eventually you don't get a sliver, you get a storm and you get the chaos that sin causes. Even if we manage to hide our sin from other people, the fact that we're engaging in sin warps and changes us and we will see the consequences in our life even if no one knows why we will see it. 
when you make a habit of lying to people. You will soon discover that people don't trust you and some unscrupulous people learn they can lie about you and no one will believe you when you deny it because you're known as a liar. When you gossip, people think when they gossip that they're building community and connection with people, but we know what they're really doing is anyone who isn't a gossip will flee from them and so they're not building community, they're pushing community away and soon the only people left are the other gossips and they all like to gossip too, so who do you think they're gossiping about next? Eventually, you'll be on the plate. When we attack others, eventually they attack back. When we sin, their storm always follows. If you think of someone who has ever had an affair, you can think of the chaos that followed when eventually it got found out and the chaos that followed before they even got discovered. There's a reality that when you sin, a storm always follows. It might affect you and it might affect others, but a storm will come. Derek Kidner says this, that sin sets up a strain in the structures of life that can only end in a breakdown. The the image he tries to point to is, if you put enough weight on a bridge, eventually the bridge can't withstand that weight anymore and something buckles and it collapses. And that's what sin does in our lives. We're making our lives do something they're not intended to do and eventually it breaks down. For Jonah, the storm that follows his sin is a literal storm. It has so much fury and power that even the pagan sailors can tell that God is doing it. That there's some sort of God behind it. But usually when we sin, we don't get a literal storm and it doesn't come as quickly as Jonah's does. Usually sin, the storms that follow sin comes with some sort of delay. It's like we get a dose of radiation or we're exposed to some sort of sickness. You can't tell right away you were exposed, but within a few days the sickness comes and often when the sickness comes, there's nothing that can be done if the exposure to radiation is bad enough. And the problem for us with sin is that sin is a lot like an addicting drug. Let's just be honest for a minute. When we sin, it's usually because it feels good to do it. Most people don't sin because they hate sinning. They sin because they like the sin. And so when we gossip, it feels kind of good to know stuff and feel like you're better than that person you're gossiping about and we like that feeling. When When someone hurts you and you start thinking about getting payback, have you ever just mauled over that wound and you just kind of stew on it for a few days and you think about, man, I I wonder what it'll feel like when I finally do this because I bet if I do that, they'll finally know how they hurt me. And you stew on it and you mull on it and you think about it and it feels good at first, right? Because you're self-righteous. You're the good one who's been wrongly wronged. You didn't do anything and look how they hurt you and you can stew on that and feel good about yourself and the whole time while you're doing that, you're encouraging bitterness and pride to grow in you and pretty soon you grow numb to the bitterness and pride in you, don't you? You don't even feel the sin. It doesn't feel as good to mull about thinking about getting even. Then you got to do it or you got to get more extreme in what you're fantasizing about what you want to do to that person to get even because we grow numb to that sin. And over time, we're not just bitter toward that person, we're bitter toward everyone else because what we've done is we've fertilized the bitterness in our hearts and we've let it grow and flourish and soon that's all that's left. And then even our other relationships don't feel as good. But in the moment, the first time you feel the bitterness, the first time you want to get revenge, doesn't it feel good just to savor that thought for a moment? It does. Or we wouldn't do it. And yet over time, we need to do it more and more to get that same feeling from that sin. And we get caught in the drug and we get addicted to it. And then the storm comes. Because when we sin, there's eventually going to be a storm. Even today, we, we can predict weather and we can understand when it's going to come, but we can't stop it, can we? And no matter how hard you try, you can't stop the storms that follow sin in our lives. Storms always follow sin. And I want to be careful because storms do always follow sin, but not all storms come from your sin. Sometimes we get storms in life that are not our fault. It's not my sin that caused it. It's someone else's. 
And there's a simple example from our text today. Jonah deserves the storm that he's in, right? He's the one running from God. He's the one refusing his commands. He's supposed to go to Nineveh. He's supposed to go east. He's going west. What did the sailors do to deserve to be on a boat that's about to get broken apart by the waves? They're just doing their job. They're just going about their life. They did not cause the storm, and yet they get caught up in Jonah's storm. Sometimes we get caught up in the chaos that other people's sin unleashes in our world. We see this when people near us get caught up in sin and we bear the consequence. When a spouse gets hooked on pornography, when a sibling is going through a painful divorce, whether it's their fault or the other, we feel the chaos from that too. When we, I had a good friend in seminary who, whose father died of alcoholism. And my friend did nothing to cause any of that storm or chaos, but it was terribly painful for him to see his father go through that and then try to process all of the grief and the loss of having a dad who wasn't really present because they were always in the bottle. He didn't cause that chaos, but he lived through that chaos. Often we experience the chaos of those closest to us because of their sin. But most often, most often the storms that we see in life don't have an obvious connection to any one sin, do they? They simply are there because of the sin that's in our world around us because sin is breaking our world apart because no one directly causes cancer. It's pollution, it's cells mutate and sometimes they mutate in bad ways and they keep mutating and they keep multiplying. We can't find the direct cause often for that. In a complex economy, sometimes companies fail, and it's not an ethical failure. It's not that no, people weren't trying to do their best. It's that part of the, the, the energy of capitalist society is the creative destruction of companies forming and falling apart, and new industries start, and old industries decaying. And sometimes we get caught up in that chaos, don't we? And jobs get lost, or we have the stress of how do we keep this thing together when everything's falling apart, and that's part of life. Everyone has storms in their life. It's an inevitable part of living in a broken and fallen world that has been marred by sin in every single corner and aspect of it. And so the question for us is not, will we have storms? The answer is yes, you will have storms. But the real question is, how might God use the storms that we experience in our lives? Because even in those storms, we can trust that God is at work somehow. God does not send us cancer. God does not cause people to hurt us. But in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of the storms of life, we can trust that God is both with us and at work in us. Paul puts it this way in Romans 8. He says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And keep it up on the screen for just a second. Just one, one thing I want to point out. It does not say that all things are good. Not everything that happens in our life is good. Getting cancer is not good. But we know that in all things, even in the bad storms, God is working for our good. Not everything is good, but God is at work in everything to bring about our good. And it's hard in the midst of the storm to see that, isn't it? It's hard when life is falling apart, when you don't know where to turn, when people have wounded you, when you're going through scary moments, to see what God is doing. But isn't it much more hopeful to, to believe and know that God is at work in that storm than to think that the storms and struggles we face are just random events that have no meaning and no purpose at all? Because then your suffering means nothing. Then your struggle is not going anywhere. It's just hard and it's a struggle, but there's no purpose in it. But if God is at work in the midst of those storms, then we can look to see what God is accomplishing, that there's a purpose for the hardship you're going through. So what might God be doing in the midst of our storms? I would suggest today that there are two things God does in our storms. He's either using them to bring us or someone else to repentance, or He uses our storms to grow us in maturity. Those are the two things God does in storms. In Jonah's storm, he can't see what God is doing because Jonah is a completely self-focused prophet. He is the worst prophet ever. If you get nothing else from our study of Jonah, no, he's bad at being a prophet. 
because he's all about him and not about God. So he can't see this. But what we can see in the story as we continue on in the next few weeks is that the sailors get caught up in the storm Jonah brought about and they see the power of God. And then we read this about those sailors in verse 16. We read, And th- at this the men, meaning the sailors, greatly feared the Lord... And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. So these sailors who are not Jewish, who are not followers of the God of Abraham, who are not believers at all, when they get on the boat, go through the storm, and they come to know who the God of Abraham is. And when God calms the storm down, what do they do? They worship God. And they make vows to God. They did not deserve the storm. They had nothing to do with why the storm came about. But in the midst of the storm... God brought these sailors to some point, some point at least, of faith because they worshiped and they made vows to God. Sometimes in the midst of of the storms of life, God is using them to bring people to faith, to bring them to repentance. One of the struggles for many of us when we think of how we follow God and what we want to look like as Christians is we think even though we've read the Bible, that God gets revealed when we look like we have our lives together. We have bought into the lie of the prosperity gospel that following Jesus means your life is going to be good. As an observation, Jesus says to pick up your cross and follow him and count the cost because it's going to be bad. It's not easy. But we think that it's in our strength that God gets revealed. But what we know is that sin and death get defeated how? Was it when Jesus looked strong that sin got defeated? Or when he died on the cross? It's in our weakness, it's in, the, in worldly weakness that God reveals his strength and accomplishes his purpose. It's when we're going through the difficult times and in our weakness, we show our faith in God that others come to know who God is in some way because it can never be about our strength, it's got to be about God. And it's in our weakness that people can see it. Often it's in our storms that we become the strongest witness for the power of God in our lives because people see that even when we're beaten and we're worn out and we're exhausted, we still trust God and they wonder why and they want to know. It's in our weakness that God's power can get revealed. And people come to faith. Other times God uses the storms not to lead us or others to repentance, but to help us mature in our faith. In his letter to to the churches, James says that we should consider our trials as pure joy. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, uh, for context, Paul writes Philippians when he's in jail in Rome and he thinks that he's going to be killed very soon. So he says his life is being poured out as a drink offering. He's ready to die. This is the end. And in that letter, he says to his to his churches, the church in Philippi, to be joyful as he is joyful. So he's in prison. He's going to be killed for proclaiming the gospel. He says, you should be joyful like I'm joyful in the midst of your suffering and your struggles. That type of joy sounds weird to us in our modern Western American culture because we don't really experience joy so much. We look for happiness. We look for finding our happiness in our in our present circumstances in the things that we have in the freedoms we have in the power that we might enjoy but paul is saying that there is a different kind of joy that we can have that's rooted not in your circumstances because no one in prison who's going to die is happy that they're there usually there's something else going on we find this joy when we have a a a firm trust in the goodness and in the sovereignty of god And we develop that by seeing God at work in the midst of our difficulties. And then we can begin to experience joy because we trust that God is there with us. You know, it's one thing to say that you trust a parachute when you're on the ground. It's another thing to say you trust the parachute when you jump out of the plane, isn't it? In one case, you intellectually trust the parachute. In the other case, you actually trust the parachute. In our lives, we actually trust God when we're going through the storm and we keep holding on and we experience His joy in our life even in the midst of the difficulties. That's when we've put our faith into action. That's part of our witness to the world around us. They get to see in the joy in us in high def when we go through the struggles of life. Storms are opportunities to demonstrate and develop this habit of joy in us. Other times, 
God uses the storm to develop our character, to develop our perseverance. I recently started working out again. You can tell, I know. You can tell. I give a little bit of a belly if I don't stand up really, really straight and suck in. So I've been working out more and I, I took my son Ethan with me to lift weights because he's been taking a weightlifting class. And I thought, my 15-year-old son can show me how to lift weights. I took a weightlifting class a really long time ago. It never stuck, as you can tell. And so I thought, I'll go with him and he can teach me stuff. And so we went and we lifted weights. And I learned two important things that day. One that day and the other the next day. One, my son does know how to lift weights and has better form than me. So that was good to know that he learned something from his education. So that's a win. And two, that... When you're 15 or when you're 21 or so and you lift weights, the next morning, your muscles still work. Because we lifted on a Saturday afternoon and then I came here and I remember leaving my chair to come up these steps thinking, I hope I don't make any sounds when I step because my legs were killing me. Because this is what happens when you lift weights. You tear the muscles when you lift weights, don't you? In fact, lifting weights doesn't do any good if you don't damage your muscles. You tear them, you, 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 you inflict trauma on your muscles, and then as your muscles heal, they get stronger and bigger, I've been told. I've never experienced that, but still, I've heard that happens. And so you lift, and you have trauma on your muscle, and then it heals, because for your muscle to ever get stronger, it has to go through trauma. For your muscle to get stronger, it has to go through trauma. For your faith to get stronger... It has to go through trauma. It has to be tested. And it's probably going to get torn just a little bit so it can grow stronger. It's what Paul says in Romans 5. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. This is an odd way to think about life, isn't it? That we glory and celebrate our, in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. If you want to be someone of hope, if you want to be someone of character, if you want to be someone who perseveres, the way you get there from a Christian perspective is through suffering. And so sometimes God sends storms in our life that are hard and are painful because he wants us to become people who can persevere and people of character and people of hope. And the only way you get there is through the traumas of life and having those muscles get built in you. And God uses those storms to bring, out, bring about the character we need. God uses, uses storms to help us develop joy, to develop character, and sometimes He allows storms in our lives so we will remember our weakness. So we'll remember our weakness. And this is Paul's point in 2 Corinthians. He says this in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more, all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul was brilliant. He was a great theologian. He was a successful church planter. He was a good pastor. He was a key leader in the early church. Before that, he was one of the up-and-coming rising stars in Judaism. He had all of the skills. He had everything going for him so that he could think that he accomplished all of this by his own strength and he could begin to be filled with pride. He could think he could handle life on his own. And so God sent him a thorn in the side. He sent him a messenger from Satan to remind him that he wasn't all that. That he couldn't do it all on his own. That he needed God's strength, not his strength. Sometimes God uses the storms in our life to help us remember that no matter how competent we are, no matter how talented we are, no matter how good we are at being good people, we can't do this on our own. We need Him. And sometimes the storms come so that we can remember that we are not as great as we think we are, but God is greater than we can imagine. And so God sends a storm. 
Tim Keller tells a story that he read years ago that no one else can find any evidence of. So I think he made it up, but I liked the story, so I'm going to share it with you. So once upon a time, because all good stories start that way, there was an evil witch who lived in the woods. And when travelers would come by her house, she would offer them room and board, and they could stay for free. And they would stay on this most wonderful, comfortable bed, and they would have the best night's sleep of their lives. But what they didn't know is that the bed was full of dark magic, and if they were asleep when the sun came up, they would be turned to stone. And so people would come by and they would stay in this bed and they would sleep till after the sun came up and she would take the stone person now and put them in her, her statuary park and she would walk around by all of her enslaved statues and she delighted in enslaving these people. She had a servant girl who worked with her who was under the witch's power but still had thoughts of her own and she grew to have compassion for these people because she, she had just had pity for their suffering as they were turned to stone forever caught in her statuary park. And one day, a, a young man came by and he chose to stay at the house and this, this servant girl's heart was, was, went out to him because she knew what was going to come, what would happen to him the next morning. And so, after he ate his meal, she snuck into his room and on that bed, she threw sticks and stones and thistles all through the bed. And so all night long, that man lay on the bed and he could not get comfortable and he would throw the stone out and then find another one and then a thistle and then a stick. And on and on it went and finally he gave up. And he got out of bed early, well before the sun came up. And as he left, he said to the woman, this is the most uncomfortable bed ever. You should be embarrassed. How can you let anyone sleep on that bed? He was furious. And as, as he left, the servant girl said to herself, but those sticks and stones were my stones of love for you to save you. And there's a reality sometimes that the storms that we experience in life are sent by God because if we don't go through them, we won't learn to follow Him. We won't learn to trust Him. And we will find that without those storms, we can go through life and have a nice, comfortable, easy life, but we'll never learn to follow and look to Him and we'll have an eternity apart from him. And so God sends the storms and lets them come so that we can learn what it is to love and trust him in the middle of the hardship and our faith can grow and we can come to follow. In the middle of Jonah's storm, he gets thrown in the water, as you know, and a big fish comes and saves him. And I'm reminded of Romans 8 that even in the midst of the struggles, God is still at work and God's at work in the midst of Jonah's storm and he sends the fish and he delivers Jonah. And... I don't know what storms you might be going through in your life today, but I want you to know this, that God is at work in that storm too, that God is with you in the storm that you're going through, and that God is doing something in that storm to bring about good for you and for those around you, because God does not let a storm go to waste. God uses those hardships to craft in us the character we need, the joy that we long for, to learn to depend on Him and to bring us to repentance so we can experience eternity with him. May you believe this gospel and go forth to live in the, its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we admit this morning that we don't like storms, that we wish that life was always easy and there were never anything bad that would happen to us, and yet we know that Often we cause the storms in our life and often those we love cause the storms in our lives and sometimes there are just storms. But we trust that in the midst of those storms you are at work and we ask that you would give us eyes to see you and that you would give us hearts that trust you and you would give us feet that follow you in the midst of the storms of life that our lives might point others to you and they might come to know and love you as we do. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.